I want to just close off our fantastic session with a couple of stories. Yesterday I heard someone talk, Stephen, about Tiffany O'Regan and the connection to Peter Lanton. I'm going to make that connection. When you came to that conference at Victoria, I don't know if you remember, but Tiffany O'Regan was there as our keynote speaker. And I had a conversation with Tiffany afterwards. And one of his jobs was to try to negotiate um, the spirit and, spirit and intent of the Treaty of Waitangi. And his particular responsibility was fisheries. So there was a new Labour government that was uh, elected in New Zealand. And so Tiffany was having to meet with these new people, including the new Minister of Fisheries. And Tiffany was a smoker. So he was going outside to smoke, and it just so happened that the new Minister of Fisheries was a smoker too. They went outside to have a smoke. And Tiffany turned to the minister and he said, let's cut the bullshit. Let's just get right to this. He said, we've been talking now for generations and we haven't gotten anywhere. Sea Lord is for sale. Just help us purchase Sea Lord. And that'll get us on the way. And so he was able to convince the Minister of Fisheries to help the Maori purchase Sea Lord, which was the biggest commercially owned fishery there. So by the purchase of Sea Lord and the fact that the Maoris already had, I think, 12% of the fisheries, and then the subsidiaries of Sea Lord, when you combine it all together, they ended up with something like 86% of the fishery. And then yesterday, listening to Peter talk, and I always thought this was really brilliant and it's something that we need to really think about doing, which is that we need to invest our own money in our own future. And we need to be creative and courageous in the way that we do it. Because what the Haida did was they eliminated one of the biggest third-party interests in terms of the logging industry by buying it and owning it and using it according to their own laws, their own principles, their own values. And I think that that's the kind of thinking that we need to bring forward. I want to thank uh, Francis and Catherine. I don't know where Catherine is. Uh, back here. And Aaron, Chris, Len and Pawa for helping pull this all together. I want to thank Elber, Elder Albert Dumont for welcoming us to your territories and starting us off in a good way through prayer. And I want to thank Maureen for helping us open this morning with a beautiful song. And all of you that have traveled so far Investing in yourselves to be here, which I think makes a difference. And all the chiefs and representatives that are here. The speakers, Kent McNeil, Emmanuel Brunet Jolly, Stephen Cornell, Peter Lanton, Trevor Russ, Leslie Brown, Jason Alsop, John B. Zoe, Tanya Barnaby, Chief Darcy Gray, the Lilt Chief Dean Nelson, Rosa Andrew, Ernest Armand, and to Carleton University, particularly all the students who helped us out here, and the tremendous support that Carleton has shown us by giving us this facility for free and helping us in the communications and other things as well. And I want to just, once again, just try to crystallize the rationale. <clears throat> Chief Darcy Gray asked me yesterday, because 
He was just beaming. And he said, so what next? What we envisioned through this was bringing you together, and there's a lineup of other First Nations who couldn't be here, who wanted to be. Fort Nelson First Nation, Taltan Band, Notley, Tanaha are waiting to hear a report back, and there are others. <clears throat> the idea is to bring respective nations across the country together so that we can occupy the whole field that we need to and have different nations starting from different places. If you can imagine our inherent right as a ball. We're, we're all starting from different places that occupies the whole space. And you're determining to working with your people and your community the support that you need in terms of applied research. As an, as an example, what started me off again on this whole project was Big Mama Oyomi talking about can we start with fisheries legislation? Well, the first question that we need to address is do you have the jurisdiction? And I believe the short answer is yes, but nevertheless we got to do it. So everybody understands that yes, we do. And secondly, what about lawmaking? Where do you want to start? Everybody wants to start from our own law. So we need to research it. We need to find what it is. And then we have to put that up against our current situation today and determine whether we need to change it, amend it, or if we need brand new law. And put the laws in place. In a lot of places I go when I talk about putting in place our laws, people's eyes flip up. So one of the things we need to look at is what about lawmaking? And in terms of fisheries, what about regulations? What about policies? IPAC's important connection to this is what about capacity? So we do that research. And the idea is that research is then given to everybody else who needs it. And if we have another nation that's starting with the Indian Act, which we need to deal with, and Liltwat is in the process of doing that, if we can work through working with Liltwat, address all those issues, as many as we can, and we make that available to everybody else. So the idea is, through this process, like with the Council of the Haida Nation, the lawmaking that they're engaged in, dealing with their people, we take that experience. So when we consolidate all of that research and the collective experience that you are doing, what we should effectively end up, say within three to five years, is a transitional governance model that every other First Nation can use too. And in that process, I was thinking about this last night, thinking about my life, doing this, thinking what pushed me off. And I was telling Francis about it. I grew up in the midst of total social chaos. It's where our people, the biggest brunt of being taken off the land and the turn to alcohol and I watched as a young person everything crumble we had big gardens we had animals we were on the land and I watched it all crumble to the point and I remember the last cow being slaughtered in my community and what I remember about it was everybody was drunk and I remember one day standing outside feeling sorry for myself, wondering, doesn't anybody love me? Doesn't anybody care? And I made up my mind then, I'm not going to let this beat me. I'm going to do something about this. And I was thinking about that last night, and I was thinking, when you all go home, and when we start working together to do this, man, you're making my dream come true.
then I also thought, no, it's not just my dream. You're making your dream come true too. Because this thing that we're looking at doing is our collective dream. And by working together, we're going to make our dream come true. And I always think about our children and the fiscal relationship that we have in Canada right now where just for essential services alone, the Canadian public per capita receives in the neighborhood of $18,500 per person for essential services. And our people on the reserve in our community receive about $9,500 for everything, including essential services. And I look at that and I say, our children do not deserve that. So it's incumbent on us to write that. And that's the way I see this. And I want to, you know, I'll end here. One of my best and greatest advisors was a medicine man. I spent many, many years with medicine people. My father was a medicine man. And he said to me, the best advice I can give you when you step out there, don't just make noise. He says, because, because what starts with noise just ends up as noise. But when I was listening to you all working, I thought, this is really good noise. So I want to thank you all for being here. And I'm looking really forward to us all working together to move forward. That's the big, that's the dream, man. Thank you. <laughs>